Good morning. Our first session this morning uh, in what's new in my field is on uh, gallbladders, disease, and surgery. Uh, Dr. Bob Mosinger did his undergraduate studies at the University of Utah, where he also earned his medical degree in 1992. Uh, he did the Halstead General Surgery Residency at John Hopkins Hospital from 1992 to 2000. This included a two-year uh, research fellowship, a six-month rotation at Beaumont Hospital in Dublin, Ireland in 1997, and a clinical faculty fellowship in gastrointestinal and pancreatic surgery. After completing his residency, he joined the faculty at the University of Maryland as an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery and Section of Surgical Oncology, focusing on gastrointestinal surgery and especially pancreatic surgery. From 2002 to 2005, he served as associate program director of that residency program. He's a fellow in the American College of Surgeons, and he has published multiple papers on periampillary tumors and colon cancer. In 2006, uh, Bob and his family returned to Ogden um, to continue the Mosinger lineage of healthcare in the Ogden area. I believe there's been a Mosinger since about 1945 on, in, in Ogden, and uh, it's great to have him back. He's on the staff at both hospitals. Uh, he um, has a special interest in upper GI tract disease, and particularly oncology. Um, he's uh, added a lot to our community in terms of our surgical, surgical capabilities and management of these problems. Um, he runs a University of Utah Rural Surgery Fellowship. Uh, he's president of the Utah chapter of the American College of Surgeons. He's made a, a significant impact in that organization, knowing it myself. Um, and he's here to talk to us uh, this morning uh, about updating us on gallbladder disease and gallbladder surgery. Bob? Well, good morning. It's very, very nice to be here, and I appreciate uh, Dr. Whipple's introduction. Um, the, um, the temptation to just add to what he said about my family is almost overwhelming. Um, and um, I was just, my dad is here, and it's always great to, to have my dad here. And I was pointing out that my dad has practiced medicine now in six decades the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the aughts, and the teens, and still going strong. And, and uh, so when Dr. Whipple says that there's been a family member here practicing medicine, that a huge, the huge bridge of that has been my father. And it's, it's, I, I feel very honored to try and follow in his footsteps. So I, I wanted to throw that out there. Um, my talk today is on uh, gallbladder disease, and I want everybody to take one minute and just notice that I colored the slides green just in honor of this talk. So that, was, that, that, was, that, was took, that took a lot of effort and a lot of thought, particularly for a surgeon who aren't known to be artistic. Um, next slide. Or do, or do I advance? Oh, wait, I'll bet this is it. There we go. Did I do that or did you do that? Did, is this the clicker? It looks like it might. Oh, it is, isn't it? OK, good. All right, sorry about that. So I have no really relevant financial disclosures, except that, like many surgeons, <clears throat> I let, or the gallbladder helps educate my children. And so anything I say could be skewed by that relationship. The other disclosure that I have is that, and this, you'd think I'd have learned my lesson. Um, the night before you're going to give a talk is probably a bad time to be on call. Um, nevertheless, I was on call. I finished operating at four. If I say anything that's completely confusing, please take it as unintentional side effect of mild sleep deprivation. 
Um, the objectives is to understand a little bit more about uh, gallbladder disease, and I and I want to make and I'll make a comment or two about um, the uh, the how aggressive we tend to be in terms of uh, gallbladder disease. I kind of laughed when Dr. Gonzalez asked me to do to talk about what's new in my specialty. You know it. It hardly seems reasonable to have the gallbladder disease be what's new in my specialty, considering that we know of at least one person who had gallstones back in 1000 BC. This was a posthumous discovery in an Egyptian mummy, an apparent priestess. And um, the first recognition of gallstones in life was credited to Alexander of Trails in the 6th century BC, and I have absolutely no idea how he figured out that the living person had gallstone disease, but in any way, he has that credit. Um, Dr. Bobbs was a surgeon who did the first cholecystotomy in 1867, and even my dad wasn't around back then, but apparently removed stones, uh, but leaving the gallbladder in place. Dr. Longenbuch, in 1882, did a cholecystectomy, and this was very new ground. Nobody had ever done this before, not that it couldn't be done, but nobody knew for sure that it should be done. But he surmised, based on the fact that elephants and rats and horses don't have gallbladders, that humans could probably survive without one. And so he performed the first cholecystectomy in 1882. So none of this is really very recent. Um, the, the last really big innovation was the introduction of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which once again was in 1987. Um, hardly a very new thing, and uh, MRCP, which uh, helped revolutionize our ability to um, to see stones and to make some uh, to diagnose gallbladder illnesses, that came about in 1991. Um, there are a couple of new things that are out there. There's the single port cholecystectomy, which has actually been tried by surgeons um, in our community. And, large, and abandon, it just really doesn't help. It doesn't really change very much. Now, much more dramatic is the notes surgery, or natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery. And it can be done, and there are people out there, uh, nobody that I know, who are enthusiastic, enthusiastic proponents of notes surgery, um, where you essentially, all the trocars go in through the stomach or the vagina, and uh, you end up getting your gallbladder out without an incision, or at least without an incision that can be seen. Um, and I'm not one to make a lot of predictions, but I don't see that taking off uh, the way that laparoscopic cholecystectomy did, for example. And, but I could be wrong. So here is a classic picture. Um, you see the gallbladder and two stones well marked. You can tell that those are the stones because they have X's on them. And the, uh, the presence of these stones is a, uh, causes, uh, can cause a whole lot of trouble for the particular patient. And here's a nice picture of a gallbladder that's been removed that's chock full of stones, so to speak. And in, we still see that. This, this is not like unusual. There's sometimes you get a gallbladder that's truly full of stones. This is kind of an interesting slide. And it demonstrates the, how different the incidence of gallbladder disease is throughout the world. And if you look at uh, all the way to the right, um, among Native American women, incidence of gallstone disease exceeds 65%, which is really quite remarkable. If you live in Thailand, Japan, Tunisia, for whatever reason, uh, your incidence of gallstones is much, much lower. And in fact, there's this it's kind of an interesting map where you see in red the areas of the world that are high incidence of gallstone disease, um, the incidence of intermediate disease, and the in incidence of low disease. It's kind of interesting to postulate, and I don't want to, I don't want to say anything terribly uh, e economic or political, but you have to wonder if you took the same map and had high incidence of fast food restaurants intermediate incidence of fast food restaurants and low incidence of fast food restaurants if the map would relatively line, or the two maps would relatively line up. 
I have not done that research, but you have to kind of wonder, is there something about the Western diet that may be promoting gallstones? It, it's, the scope of gallbladder disease is really quite impressive. We do about 500,000 cholecystectomies a year, and, um, the, uh, and that's in a population where the prevalence of gallstones is estimated to be 10 to 20 percent over a lifetime. It's very interesting, though. There's an article that uh, this was from JAMA, as you can see, back in the early 90s, and they noted <clears throat> that in 1988, we removed 1.35 gallbladders per thousand people, and yet in 1992, we almost doubled that, or up about 70 percent anyway, to 2.15 cholecystectomies per thousand. A, uh, it's actually a 60% increase, as you can see. And the reason for that is pretty clear. That was the advent of laparoscopy. And the, uh, and the incidence of cholecystectomy dramatically rose in a very short time. And a lot of people at the time thought that, well, that was a, a, uh, a surge, if you will, meaning that all of the closet gallstone patients who were living with their gallbladders finally had the opportunity to get them out safely and um, not that it wasn't safe, but a little bit more easily than it had been before. And so all of these people rushed out of their closets to get their gallbladders removed. But the interesting thing is, is the incidence of cholecystectomy never dropped. It stayed above two. And in fact, the, um, the, uh, it, that we're probably up to where we're taking out about three gallbladders per thousand each year in this country. And those figures aren't exact, but that's, it's got to be pretty close. If you compare that to Northern Ireland, where they take out one gallbladder per thousand people each year. Locally, and maybe this is a little bit more meaningful, I very carefully polled all of the ORs in, uh, the, in Weber County, and in the month of January, we did 80 cholecystectomies. That is about 1,000 cholecystectomies for the year. And to put that in perspective, there were 9,300 births at the hospitals in Weber County uh, this, or in 2012. So we're taking out about 10% of all the gallbladders that are being born each year in, in Weber County. And um, so it's, that's a fair number. The, in, in along these lines, I was involved in a study that was never published where, and it was in the early 90s, it was at Johns Hopkins Hospital, I call it the Boitnot study because that was the name of the pathologist who I worked with, but we pulled something like 200 gallbladder slides in the pre-laparoscopic era and in the post-laparoscopic era and looked at the gallbladder wall thickness and averaged them. And the gallbladder wall thickness in the pre-laparoscopic era was st highly statistically significantly um, greater than it was in the post-laparoscopic era. And I don't know exactly what that means, but we, we postulated that the gallbladders were sicker in the, be, before we started taking them out laparoscopically. And it was, the p-value was like .00001. I mean, it was really remarkable. And if you, you put that all together, and I think the data s supports what I've said here, that we are taking out more gallbladders and less sick gallbladders than we were 25 or 30 years ago. I also polled our pathology departments, and this was just this year, and it's a small sample, but I, we looked at 40 consecutive gallbladders, and 28% of those gallbladders, 20 at each hospital, um, were, uh, did not have any stones. They were just, they were acalculus gallbladders that, that were removed, which is an interesting statistic. Um, by taking out more gallbladders, are we reducing gallbladder complications? Well, there was a nationwide database which suggested that the incidence of admission for acute cholecystitis dropped 14% over the, over the decade from 2000 to 2010. But I don't know if this reflects a true decrease in acute cholecystitis or just the fact that people are being admitted less frequently for acute cholecystitis because they'll go to the ER, they'll get diagnosed, they'll get their gallbladder out a few hours later, and then they'll go home so they don't count as an admission. 
So I don't know what that means, but if you look at pancreatitis, gallstone pancreatitis, um, at least half of pancreatitis would be gallstone pancreatitis, that same database said there was a 30% increase in admissions for acute pancreatitis over the same decade. So I'm not sure that we can say that by taking out more gallbladders, we are preventing gallbladder complications. But the one thing that is, you can say for sure, even if it's tough to measure, is that the more gallbladders we take out, there are complications associated with that. Um, bile duct injury, of course, is the most feared complication, and the, um, and the rate is about 0.1 to 0.2 percent of patients who have a cholecystectomy will have a bile duct injury, and that's a very morbid injury, as, as most of you know. And so if we're taking out, let's say that the 28% of the 1,000 gallbladders we're taking out every year are not that sick, that means roughly every two to four years, somebody in Weber County statistically will have a bile duct injury in a gallbladder that was not that sick. Similarly, there is evidence out there that, uh, that having the gallbladder removed early in life increases your risk of colon cancer. It's not a big increase. It may be somewhere between 10 and 20%. But if your lifetime risk of colon cancer is 5% and you have a 20% increase, that means you now have a 6% risk of getting colon cancer, then you have about, looking at my number, there we have about two patients a year who had their gallbladders removed, who were not that sick, who are getting colon cancer statistically that they otherwise would not have. And so I guess, and I find that as a, um, that I see a lot of patients referred for cholecystectomy um, who don't have stones, uh, who may have an abnormal HIDA scan, mildly abnormal, but have right upper quadrant pain that's tough to explain. And I'm not sure I have the answer to all that, but I think it's something that we should all be aware of. When we talk about the manifestations of gallstone disease, and this is a great diagram, well, I work a lot with students, and the um, when I often, I often say, one of my favorite questions is, is name nine different ways that gallstone disease can present. And they look at me funny, like, you mean like nine different symptoms? I say, no, nine different distinct clinical syndromes that gallstone disease can present. It's a question that can literally take you through an entire day of surgery before you've finally gotten through all of them and gotten all the answers. And it's, it's a great way to pimp a student with just one question. I, I highly recommend it. But this diagram sort of shows all the different ways that gallstones can cause trouble. And uh, far and away the most common is biliary colic and um, chronic cholecystitis, which I call biliary colic squared. And this is the most common indication for cholecystectomy. It's acute intermittent cystic duct obstruction. Um, the patients have the classic biliary attacks that we all know about with right upper quadrant pain, radiates to the back, they get nauseated, it usually hurts at night, it gets better in a few hours, they're fine between attacks, and then it happens again with the next fatty meal. And in these patients, once you have uh, stones on ultrasound, a cholecystectomy is, is certainly uh, appropriate and warranted. I do note that a lot of elderly patients have, some, have an atypical presentation where they may just have mild nausea or sort of loss of appetite. And it can take a while to figure out that they have stones and then trying to figure out whether that's the problem. But there's no question there could often be an atypical presentation in the elderly. Um, acute cholecystitis is persistent cystic duct obstruction. And in the United States, there's over a quarter of a million admissions for acute cholecystitis and a thousand deaths. And um, this can be, it's sort of the biliary colic attack that just won't go away. Um, it can be diagnosed with ultrasound. Sometimes a HIDA scan can be done uh, in difficult cases. And in this case, we now know that an expeditious cholecystectomy is the, is the best and the most efficient way to treat these patients. Many of you We'll remember older days when we talked about letting the inflammation die down and then maybe taking out the gallbladder a few weeks later. There's very good data now that once a patient's been diagnosed with acute cholecystitis, that you getting their gallbladder out at the, the next most convenient hour is, uh, is the most efficient way to treat these patients, and, and, and that's what we really try to do. 
uh, rarely sit on these patients for longer than six to 12 hours uh, unless there's some, uh, other, uh, some, some particular reason. Then there's bile duct stones and cholangitis. And it's been estimated that about five to 10% of patients will have common bile duct stones at the time of cholecystectomy, but fortunately about 90% of those probably pass without any intervention. Nevertheless, there's about 50,000 admissions to, in the United States each year for bile duct stones and uh, cholangitis. And these patients, we now can do a very expeditious therapeutic cholangiogram and uh, pluck the stones out with ERCP and then do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And these patients can usually be treated and be back out of the hospital within 24 hours, uh, certainly 24 to 36 hours. Um, I do note that in the elderly population, if they have a bile duct stone and then it's extracted with a sphincterotomy, that a cholecystectomy is not mandatory. Once a bile duct has been opened or cut, that further stones are likely to pass, and the chances of them having further problems are probably only about 5% per year. And so the standard of care, you know, particularly in, in young patients, is you definitely take their gallbladders out to prevent future attacks. But in elderly patients, a lot of medical problems, a successful ERCP may well be all the treatment that they need. I also note that we have a very fast growing gastric bypass population in whom it's very difficult, sometimes impossible, to do an ERCP. And because of that, if these patients run into trouble with bile duct stones, um, they need to be approached with a percutaneous transhepatic cholangiogram. And it's, it's just something to keep in mind that, that this is a group of patients that will continue to, to grow. Um, this, is a, uh, this is kind of a nice picture. And I wish I had a, there probably is a pointer. Look at that, there is. Gallstones, bile duct stones, and then just yesterday, a patient came in who's 21, weighs about 95 pounds, is the exact unclassic gallbladder patient. And check this out. Stones in the gallbladder. Look at these beautiful stones in the bile duct. And she came in Wednesday night, had her ERCP Thursday morning, and I took her gallbladder out last night. Um, and um, anyway, so this is a, it's kind of a really classic picture. And um, so it, it, it happens, and fortunately, these patients can be very expeditiously get their bile ducts cleared. Um, gallstone pancreatitis is also fairly common, about 120,000 admissions per year and perhaps 1,200 deaths. And I often joke about the fact that the gallbladder in our world has no constitutional rights. What I mean by that is, is that if you have pancreatitis um, and nobody can figure out why, then it is not unreasonable, and in fact those patients are often referred for cholecystectomy because of the high chance that they had occult biliary or gallstone pancreatitis. So I often tell patients that the gallbladder generally speaking, is innocent. Most, most organs and people are innocent until proven guilty. In the case of pancreatitis, the gallbladder is really guilty until another suspect can be found. It's kind of an unfortunate thing. I'm sure if the ACLU ever found out about that, there would be an uproar. So we should probably keep that amongst ourselves. And once again, you take these gallbladders out to prevent further attacks, but it doesn't really help get over the pancreatitis that they have at the moment. Much less common are things like gallstone ileus, which is not an ileus at all. It is a gallstone that goes through a cholecystoduodenal fistula and then gets stuck at the ileocecal valve and causes a small bowel obstruction. Very, very rare. And, um, the, and then gallbladder cancer. About 90% of patients who get gallbladder cancer also have gallstones. And uh, we believe that the chronic inflammation over many, many years is a, uh, is a cause of that. Fortunately, it's rare, but it's another, another incidence of gallstone disease. And then there's asymptomatic gallstones. It's hard, to go, you can, it's hard to even go shopping today without getting an ultrasound just by accident. And so people will find out they have gallstones. And generally speaking, for asymptomatic gallstones, they can be safely left alone. But there are some, some criteria where it's completely appropriate to take out an asymptomatic gallbladder. 
or with gallstones in it. One is if, the, if, it's, a, if it's a child or a teenager. Um, some of these will be because of hemolytic anemia. If you're already there, you know, operating and doing a, taking out a colon cancer and you notice they have stones, it's certainly reasonable to take them out. Stones greater than three centimeters have been associated with an increased risk of cancer, and so that would be a criteria for taking out an asymptomatic gallstone. If you're going to be spending an extended time away from reliable medical care, that could be, you know, Malawi, that could be the Utah Valley, because, you know, BYU, okay, I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, it's okay to take asymptomatic stones if you're going to be away from reliable medical care for a long time. People talk about if you should have your gallbladder removed at the time of bariatric surgery, about a 30% of those patients will develop stones. You could go either way on that. Some people wonder if diabetics should have asymptomatic stones removed. That's sort of up in the air as well. Um, occasionally we see gallbladder disease in a critically ill patient where they get severe acute cholecystitis and get sick really fast. We try to do an expeditious cholecystectomy and that usually uh, turns things around pretty quickly. Um, and finally, you get some people who get sick for other reasons and then will develop um, cholecystitis. It can be with stones or without stones. Um, you see in trauma patients, burn patients, other critically ill patients, sometimes these people are really sick and rather than take their gallbladder out, we can do percutaneous drainage. They can keep that percutaneous tube in for months until they are uh, well enough to get it out. Gallbladder polyps, are, as the quality of our ultrasound gets better and better, we now see polyps in the gallbladder that are literally three, four millimeters. And the standard of care really is that at 10 millimeters, a polyp should be removed. Below that, they can be followed. And the interval for follow-up, I'm not sure is very well known, but, but it certainly doesn't have to be more frequent than yearly. They don't, they don't tend to grow very fast. Um, but. Uh, but anyway, that's sort of what we feel is a standard of care for gallbladder polyps. There's also cholesterolosis, where the cholesterol will cake the wall of the gallbladder. It's thought that this is probably for the most part asymptomatic, but may be a cause of acalculus cholecystitis. And, um, the, uh, the, um, and so sometimes what you'll find is in a patient doesn't have gallstone disease, they do have this, and it's it's uh, reasonable to take those gall gallbladders out. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the biliary dyskinesia, the, where the gallbladder just doesn't squeeze well. And we take out a lot of gallbladders because they have an abnormal ejection fraction on HIDA scan. We take out a lot of gallbladders who have may maybe normal or lower than expected. And undoubtedly, some of these patients benefit. Uh, and undoubtedly, some of these patients would get better on their own. Um, let me skip ahead because this is a, um, get to this, I spent a lot of time making this slide. And in a patient has biliary symptoms, an ultrasound that's positive pretty much always leads to surgery. An ultrasound that's negative will usually get a HIDA scan. If they do have a true low ejection fraction, it's probably appropriate to go ahead and take those gallbladders out. But these patients have a normal HIDA scan. This is probably really important, time. They don't, if at any point they get better, then you can leave them alone. You can do a CT scan, which if, if you find something to treat, great. Um, if, it's, if it's negative, more time. Um, if they still have symptoms, GI consultation, endoscopy, MRCP would all be appropriate. And if it's negative, but they still have symptoms, time. Eventually, some of these patients, everybody throws their hands up and says, well, let's take the gallbladder out and see what happens. About 40% of those patients do get better, but there's a significant number, obviously the majority really don't, and they need to be carefully counseled whoops, before we take out those gallbladders. In the end, gallbladder disease is common, it's highly variable, and um, there's a lot, you know, a thoughtful approach is, is obviously very important. And I really do believe we probably take out too many gallbladders and um, it behooves all of us to, to try to keep that in mind. And, and um, those patients, 
There's always one out there who insists that everybody in their family had their gallbladder out, even though they were all normal, and then they all became Harvard scholars afterwards. And it's tough sometimes to say, well, gosh, you know, there's really no evidence that this is your gallbladder, but I think sometimes we need to be prepared to do that. And I'll take questions. Yes, Dr. Nellis. Is there any indication for open colorectal? Absolutely. Um, and in fact, it has been said that the, the most common time to do an open cholecystectomy is five minutes after you should have done an open cholecystectomy, meaning that you've, you've, you've pushed too hard laparoscopically and, and um, something is bleeding or something is injured. Fortunately, that doesn't happen very often, but in our world, virtually every cholecystectomy will at least be attempted laparoscopically. Um, but uh, a conversion rate, and I quote patients, a 5% conversion rate to an open procedure. And surgeons, I think it's really important that all surgeons are very willing to swallow their pride and say, you know what, this is not going laparoscopically, and to go ahead and make an incision. There is no shame. And in, and in my own personal series, I have somewhere between a five and six percent open cholecystectomy rate, and it's, so it's it's perfectly appropriate, and we should all know how to do it, and we should all do it before we realize we should have started doing it five or ten minutes ago. Question? Yeah. Hey, over here. Oh yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, j just given what your, your presentation, uh, four to ten percent increased cancer risk with cholecystectomy and the number jumping up after the laparoscopic colostectomy started. So given that, you, well, your last comment was that we should be doing fewer of them. It seems to me, I, I work in the emergency department, we see somebody with uh, biliary colic, the ultrasound shows gallstones, they go to surgery. Yes. What guidelines would you give us to tell patients in terms of postponing colostectomy? Do you give it time, or, or how would you cut down the number of people getting their gallbladders out? I think that those who have stones they're, they're, and have symptoms, they're going to get referred to surgery and appropriately so. It's the patients who don't have stones, have a normal appearing gallbladder, and then a normal HIDA scan. I think those are the patients that we really want to put the brakes on where possible and say, you know, much, much, this will usually get better with time. And the, you know, if they just have persistent symptoms, something like six months goes by, then a lot of those patients will eventually get referred for what I call the desperation cholecystectomy. But those are the ones we really want to put the brakes on are the ones with a negative ultrasound and sort of these symptoms that we're just having a hard time explaining. Okay. Hey, Bob, on your right, to your right, microphone. Oh, hey. there we go. Wow. The, you have a normal ejection fraction on your HIDA scan, a negative ultrasound. Yes. But the patient has exact same reproducible pain with the HIDA scan. What do you do with those patients? I, and I, a radiologist might be able to comment better than I can, but I find that reproducible pain during the HIDA scan, when you give the CCK, I don't find that that helps very much. I think most normal people, if you gave them a big blast of CCK, we would, a lot of us would feel a, un, or discomfort with it. So I'm not sure that that part of the test is as meaningful as it, as it would be nice if that it were. Yeah, Dr. Allen. You mentioned the most serious complication is bile duct injury. Yes. So how do you manage that? That's a long story, but in the end, it really requires a multidisciplinary approach, usually between surgeon and interventional radiologist. Um, the most important thing is if you're going to injure a bile duct is to recognize it at the time of surgery and then either refer for immediate primary repair or if you, are, if, if you, if you do a lot of biliary surgery, then those are certainly you can repair. Um, you know, in the hands of the surgeon at the time that it's recognized. It really, the surgeon needs to know at that moment what they're most comfortable with. And immediate referral is, a, is certainly acceptable, um, or if you have the skills and you do biliary surgery, then open and repair is, is acceptable. The ones who don't get discovered for a few days, those are much tougher to manage. Bob. Bob. <laughs> 